a little story that will help Miss Michelle remember how to pronounce the home diocese of Father Bouquet. Home of Thibodeau. Okay, I'm going to tell a, a Cajun joke. There are many Cajun jokes about, because there are a lot of people named, um, oh, wait a second. Can somebody bring me my cell phone out of my bag? If you go to my bag there, it's sitting right there. If you bring me my bag, I'll get my timepiece out. Otherwise, I'll talk too long. Anyway, while they're doing that, um, there are two characters named Thibodeau and Boudreau who are the subject of many um, adventures. Here we go. Because I don't want to go on too
One of the things that took place in 2018 that I want to call to your attention before I go into the other material is that right around that time, I had hired Father Paul Sullins uh, as a senior research associate at the Ruth Institute. He's retired. He's a married Catholic priest. He used to be Anglican. And he was a professor of sociology at Catholic University of America for a long time. And he came to me, and we were talking about it. So he has done a variety of research on uh, the impact of same-sex parenting on children. And so I said, I think this would be a good fit for the Ruth Institute. And in fact, uh, the brochure I mentioned to you yesterday that has research about same-sex parenting, a lot of that comes from work that Father Sullins has done. So I said, this is a good fit. Great. This is great. So uh, he's been working with me for, I don't know, a couple of months. The Theodore McCarrick scandal breaks out. Everybody's talking about it. I pick up the phone and I start nerding out talking to him about the John Jay report, uh, which was this big report commissioned by the U.S. bishops that basically said uh, that homosexuality wasn't an issue in clergy sex abuse in the United States. And I said, you know, Father Sullins, are you familiar with the John Jay report? He goes, are you kidding me? Of course I'm familiar with it. You know, of course he knew everything about it. And, uh, and shared my assessment that this was not uh, correct. But, and then he says to me, you know, the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report is out there, and, which is this huge document. I don't know if it made news over here, but this is a very large document done by the Attorney General of the state of Pennsylvania, um, you know, like 800 pages or something, a very big document um, talking about all the cases of clergy sex abuse that had taken place over the years. Father Sullen says to me, we can turn that into data. And I said, what do you mean? Well, you get a research assistant to go through and read it and go case by case, and you code each case with the variables that you're interested in. So that, and I asked him how much it would cost, and he's like, oh, that sounds reasonable. So we did it. You know, we, he uh, engaged the people and created a data set out of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. And so therefore, what we, he ended up doing was to analyze that data with a new report that came out in 2018. And he asked the question of this body of data, is Catholic clergy sexual abuse related to homosexual priests? And the answer that he came up with was yes. Okay, the short answer is yes, it absolutely is. And this is uh, one of the key figures of his, uh, of, of his result, showing this very strong correlation between the percentage of Catholic priests who, who claim a homosexual identity and the, um, and, and the incidence of clergy sex abuse. He did a further study that was based on uh, recent data gathered from Catholic dioceses, because the Catholic, in the Catholic Church in America, every diocese is supposed to have a report every year. And so the report just sits there. Nobody ever does anything with it. But so Father Sullins went and looked, that and looked at that and um, basically created an updated file that would take you all the way through, um, th through uh, 2000 and 2010 and so on, update, basically update the data. And basically, in that second report, what he found was that there is a, a um, there are fewer cases, but there is a disturbing in increase in the cases, um, and that there does seem to be uh, more female victims now than there used to be percentage-wise. So we cannot be complacent about this matter. Okay, okay this is the, the point of it. There's waving going on here. Am I missing something? What? Oh no! It comes up and down. Oh man! <laughs> These charts are great too. Can we still slide? What? Just briefly. There we go. By the way, let me remind you. Let me take this opportunity to remind you that uh, you know what this is. This is a, um, a devil cyber cyber attack. This happens to us all the time. Let me remind you, if you've signed up for our stuff, you're going to get these slides for your very own, so you can click through them, you know, uh, read them at your leisure. Anyhow, um, the, the, the point is, uh, there, we are, uh, there are some changes in a clerk, the pattern of clergy sex abuse. It is not all gone. We are, have no business being complacent about it and acting like there's, you know, this, we solved this. We haven't solved it. We, we can't be complacent, that's the point. And so um, the Ruth Institute has gotten relatively more concerned and involved with this issue of childhood sexual abuse because we think it needs attention. It needs to be brought to people's attention, just the full impact of what this means to the victims and their families. And so on our YouTube channel, we have a whole playlist 
that is concerned with childhood sexual abuse. So it's not all about Catholic clergy sex abuse, but it's just about childhood sexual abuse. And among other things, like this particular image here, is of an interview I did with the brother of someone who was abused, who could walk us through what this meant in the life of his family. And just so people have a realistic picture um, of, of, what this, of what this means for people. We also have interviews with therapists and you know, just a number of things. So um, we've also got a new feature at the Ruth Institute called Ask a Survivor. Um, this is Mrs. Faith Hakesley. Uh, she was uh, sexually assaulted by her Catholic priest when she was uh, 15. And she, her story ends as well as it could ever end. Her parents believed her when she told them, um, and, her, and she went to court, and her perpetrator was put in prison. Okay, so that's about as good as it gets from the perspective of a victim, but she still is making herself available to talk with people about what this is, what this whole experience is like. And we're trying to educate the Catholic public in particular about why we need to be um, attentive uh, to this issue, okay, and not, uh, not try to be swept away with sort of ecclesial politics uh, and its implications for ecclesial politics, but to, to really think about the victims and what it means to them. So, and, and in particular, um, we, I think, I would say from the perspective of an American, in, in the early realms of clergy sex abuse, in 2002, liberal Catholics used that as an opportunity to do two things. One, to make John Paul look bad, and number two, to say the church's teaching is out of date, okay, and needs to go away, okay. So our approach at the Ruth Institute is completely um, the opposite of that. We don't actually care who looks bad or who looks good. We just want to know, did they do it? You know, that's kind of more important. Uh, but also, we believe in the teachings of the church. And so you will find that the victims and survivors that we interview and talk with are not people who are going to stand there and pound the pavement and say, we got to get rid of celibacy, or we got to get rid of the church has to reform on homosexuality. But that, those aren't the people who are drawn to us. The people we interview and talk with are people who believe that implementing and living out the church's teaching is the solution to all of these problems. So um, it's an interesting opportunity and an interesting moment for the church right now. Okay, um, so the three things I'm gonna talk with you about in this presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you about how pervasive pedophilia and childhood sexual abuse and sexual harassment, how pervasive it is worldwide and throughout sectors of society. Secondly, I'm gonna talk with you about the early proponents of the sexual revolution and some of what they taught and believed and wanted to have happen. And you will see that the sexualization of children has been part of the agenda going all the way back to the 1930s, okay? Um, and then thirdly, uh, I want to show, and then this is I think the most crucial thing for us to understand kind of analytically, is that the ideology of the sexual revolution demanded that we redefine childhood, that we redefine what it means to be a child, what children need from their parents, okay, and how we ought, what kind of policies we ought to have regarding parents and children. That is baked, that's what I mean when I say baked in from the beginning, that this is all, all a big part of it. So let's first of all uh, talk about how pedophilia and sexual abuse is pervasive among global, global elites. Before I say anything more, I want to say that people in the room, in a room this size, there may be somebody who is themselves a survivor of some kind of sexual abuse or harassment. Surely, when this goes on tape and goes on the internet, there will be people who watch it who have had this kind of experience. So what I want to say is that I recognize that PTSD is a real thing. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a real thing. If you are triggered or upset, just stop the tape, you know, and, and do what you need to do to take care of yourself, okay? One of our uh, speakers that we had a couple of years ago gave a talk on her experiences being sexually abused by both of her parents, and by the time she was done, she could barely walk because that experience of talking about it was, you know, was a, a re-stimulation. So that's my word to survivors. Now I want to say a word to everybody else. False accusations are a horrible, horrible thing. PTSD is real, triggering is real, and trivializing sexual abuse by saying, I'm triggered over every little political thing that comes up, you need to stop that. 
anybody who does that. That is an awful thing to do. And false accusations for political purposes, also an awful thing to do, because it makes it very hard for people who have actually gone through it to be believed and, and accepted. So, that in mind, the global ruling class likes the sexual revolution. They like it just the way it is. You guys know that by now, right? The global ruling class likes the sexual revolution just the way it is, including pedophilia. They like pedophilia just fine. So I'm going to give you a few examples to prove why I, why I believe this. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a wealthy uh, organization in the United States. I would call it a race baiting organization. And they're, um, they're the ones who come, come up with a list of who counts as a hate group. Okay, so I'm a hate group, according to them. I wear this as a badge of honor that these people think this about me. But anyway, um, one of the things that's come out in the past few years is that their founder, Morris Dees, was sexually harassing his female subordinates on a regular basis. Okay, and no one in the organization would do anything or say anything about it. You know, it was this whole culture of silence. They were all intimidated into silence. And uh, I interviewed a guy who wrote this book, Making Hate Pay, my friend Tyler O'Neill there. The next example, public schools in the United States. The title of the book here is Passing the Trash. What do you suppose that means? That means they found a prince of school principals causing all kinds of problems. They just kept moving them around and nobody would stop. Okay? Same problem, different institution, exactly same problem. The next example, which is in some respects the worst, is the United Nations. Okay? The United Nations has its whole series of sex scandals that have come out over the years. One of the grossest is their peacekeeping, their, their peacekeepers who uh, basically coerce children in the peacekeeping camps with food for sex kind of rings, okay? In multiple countries this has come out, okay? And uh, it's documented in this particular book, but it's, it's been in the newspapers and so on and so forth. But, and in, in, in addition to that, this particular individual, Peter Newell, uh, was himself individually, personally found guilty of, of sexual abuse. And he is the author of, if, if you can see what it says here, children's rights advocate found guilty. Okay, what they mean by children's rights advocate is that he is the author of the implementation of the handbook of the convention of the rights of the child, all right? And what they mean when they say the rights of the child, they mean the children's rights to have sex without their parents knowing about it. Oddly enough, this man likes to have sex with children, okay? That's what we're dealing with with the United Nations. Okay, so uh, as you know, we, I explained to you the other day, when we talk about children's rights at the Ruth Institute, we mean children's rights to a relationship with their parents and their right to know their identity. When the UN talks about the rights of children, they mean children's rights to have sex without the parents knowing it. Um, and then, of course, we have sexual abuse by Catholic clergy. The patterns are the same. Now, as Catholics, we have this, this is very hard for us. This is very painful for us to see this and face it. And I don't know about you, but I miss the feelings that we had under John Paul where we felt like we were part of something big and beautiful and, and wonderful and everything. Um, and I want to say we're going to deal with that feeling because that's a valid thing to feel. Um, but there's a, there, there are some things we have to deal with, okay? So why am I bringing up all these other groups? I am not bringing it up to say, oh well, everybody else is just as bad as the Catholic Church. It's not really so bad in the Catholic Church. The Boy Scouts are doing it, Hollywood's doing it, the politi politicians are doing it. That's not why I'm bringing it up. I'm bringing it up for this reason. None of those other groups has the slightest chance of doing anything about it, right? The United Nations is never going to repent, <laughs> right? If we don't do something about it, nobody's going to do anything about it. And that's why I'm bringing it to your attention. All right, next, next topic. The early proponents of the sexual revolution and what they believed. Now, this came to my attention when I was interviewing a couple of different scholars uh, for my weekly video podcast program called The Dr. J Show. I was interviewing uh, Scott Yenner, who's written a couple of important books. Um, Carl Truman, who's also written an important book, and they were talking about the sexual revolution in different ways. These are political philosophers type people, right? And what they both talked about were individuals 
whose ideas led up to what we would today call the sexual revolution, okay? So one of them is Wilhelm Reich, Alfred Kinsey, and a, a, a feminist named Shulamith Firestone, okay? And both, both these authors were you know, talking about these guys and what they believed. As far as I know, these three people were not themselves pedophiles, okay? Um, none of them directly advocated pedophilia, and yet their theories led us to where we are today. So that's what I want to spell out for you. Let's start with Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich, you can see his dates there, he died in 1957. Um, he's the author of the book, The Sexual Revolution, as far as I know, the first person to ever use that term. He was influenced by Freud, and to be quite honest, he was a nut job. He was a complete whack job. He believed that there was energy in the environment called organ, organ, or yeah. And he could accumulate this, and then this would make you happy, and so on. So anyway, the FDA, somebody complained about this. The FDA thought this was consumer fraud. And he died in prison, because he had been in prison for consumer fraud with the organ thing, OK? Um, the next person I want to mention to you is Alfred Kinsey, who is a name that some of you may have heard of. Um, he wrote the books, the, the Kinsey Report, Sexual Behavior in Human Male, Sexual, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. And um, he is, he's the guy who really told Americans that everybody's doing it, you know, uh, with this kind of fake data. It's an early example of junk science, basically. Okay, and amongst his work, there is this uh, notorious, infamous uh, table number 34. Okay, which uh, if some of you may be familiar with this. This is a table that is purportedly showing uh, children having orgasms and how many orgasms they could have and how long it took them to achieve it. Okay, Kinsey said that he got this data from a guy, from a researcher who was actually himself a pedophile doing these little experiments. Okay, he should have turned this guy in. Today they would both be completely behind bars, right? But this table is still in the book. Okay, so in Kinsey's mind, children being sexual was normal. Okay, he, and this was supposed to prove that it was okay that children are capable of sexual pleasure at the age of what is the what is the youngest one here? Five months. Okay, this is this is what this was supposed to prove. Okay, so both Kinsey and um, uh, and Reich believed that children were sexual beings, and it was OK and, in fact, important for them to act out sexually. Most of the time, they were thinking about kids being sexual with other kids. But it doesn't matter. They're sexual beings. That's the key point about them. The final person I want to mention is a feminist, a very radical feminist named Shulamith Firestone, who is the author of The Dialectic of Sex, um, The Case for the Feminist Revolution. And her, um, her position was that in order to have true liberation for, for women, you have to completely neutralize everything having to do with childbearing. And so she had the idea, again, that kids should be sexualized, that kids should be allowed to have sex. Kids don't really need their parents that much, because if you admit kids need their parents, then mom's got to be there, and then it's not going to be equal anymore, and so on and so forth. So this is, she's a very radical um, feminist uh, uh, person. Broadly speaking, what these three figures have in common is they were all influenced by Sigmund Freud. They all believe that the worst problem out there is sexual repression. That sexual repression makes you crazy. Okay, And so we need to get rid of the taboos and so on so that people don't be re repressed anymore. And that the taboos are the, are the harmful problem. They all also had other objectives in mind. Okay, they had plans for society being fine, what it means to be a child. And remember, what the Ruth Institute has been telling you for the past two days, every human being has the right to a relationship with their parents and a right to know their identity, right? And this means a stable relationship with mom and dad. And the taboos protect that. The taboos make it possible for us to have that. And so, in, in order to go a little bit further with this, I'd like to take a minute and just talk about childhood and parenthood from what I think is a reasonable, rational uh, type of position, OK? Uh, back, the very first book I wrote was Love and Economics, which I wrote in 2001. And the first edition of it, you can see there, the subtitle was Why the Laissez-Faire Family Doesn't Work, which was a disaster of a subtitle because no one knew what it was talking about. Um, 
So with that, publisher went out of business, the rights reverted to me, the Ruth Institute brought out another edition in 2008, and we gave it a subtitle, Love and Economics, It Takes a Family to Raise a Village. Well, now people have a little bit better idea of what this book might be about. The reason I wrote, I want to just take a minute to tell you why I wrote this book, what motivated me. Um, in 1991, my husband and I became parents for the first time. And the way that happened is I had been a heartbroken career woman, as I had told you a little bit, hinted at a little bit before, that I, I had postponed childbearing and thought, oh, now, now that I'm about to get tenure, um, now it's time for me to have a baby. It's time for us to have a baby. Actually, I, it, it was about me. It was time for me to have, honey, I want to have a baby now. Let's have a baby now. Well, imagine my surprise. Are we okay? Are we good? Which one? Yeah, that's a good question. This is the recorder. This is the noisemaker. Excuse us. <laughs> you can cut this out when you put it up on your table. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is that better? It's working for me. Yeah. Right. Is this better? Okay. <laughs> well, anyway. Anyway, so, well, anyway, imagine my surprise when the baby did not arrive during the month that I had set aside for. Right. Uh, so, so my husband and I were confronted with an infertility crisis that went on for four years. And it was during that period of time that I came back to the practice of the faith, which is another whole story, my, my conversion story. Anyway, we resolved our infertility problem by uh, uh, agreeing to adopt a child from Romania. So this is 1991. Uh, you may remember the Berlin Wall had fallen and kids were starting to be available from behind there. Iron Curtain. So um, January 1991, we get a phone call from the adoption lady. She says, we have a little boy for you. He will be two and a half years old when you get him. Uh, we know his name, his birthday, and that he's described as being in good health. What do you say? We said, sure, why not? When you've been infertile for four years, you don't really believe a baby's ever going to show up. So what the heck? We said, yes. Ten days later, I go to the doctor with a head cold, find out I'm pregnant. <laughs> so we, we ended up having two kids in six months' time, which is a record even for a Catholic. So I knew I was back in the faith then, you know, when that happened. But um, so anyway, we get these two little ones who are three years apart in chronological age. But psychologically, um, socially, are pretty close to the same age. And what we had in our home was something, nothing in my economics background prepared me to deal with what we were dealing with here. Um, and my husband's an engineer, possibly less, uh, if possible, even less prepared, right? Um, so the two of us are basically a pair of nerds with these two children in our house. So naturally what we see is a controlled experiment, <laughs> right? And the experiment is, what do kids what do parents do for their kids? Do kids really need their mom and dad? This is the experience that convinced me that kids really, truly need their mom and dad. Now let me just give you a couple little examples of things you wouldn't know, most of you know intuitively, but you wouldn't know if somebody didn't explain it to you. Our little boy had speech problems. All the kids who came from Romania at that time, they all had speech delays, all of them did. And so we took them to different speech therapists and so on. We found out that children, uh, there's a part of the nervous system that needs to be stimulated in order to prepare you for language. Is and they stimulate it. They put the kids in a little spinner, and then they do the and then they do the um, speech therapy, and this helps. Okay. So now you think about what do moms and dads naturally do with their kids? You take well. First of all, we rock them, don't we rock them, moms? <coughs> Have you ever seen a mom in the checkout line at the supermarket with a baby on her hip? And she's got the baby on her hip, and she's going like this. She's just standing there in the line, rocking the baby like this. And she's emptying her buggy onto the car, you know, and she's rocking it all the time. And what's dad doing? Dad's going like this, bouncing the baby, right? Bouncing the baby, then the baby. It's <laughs> hilarious, and it's fun, and everything like that. What you're doing without realizing it is you're stimulating the child's nervous system, getting them ready to talk. Well, who knew, right? Well, so you leave a kid in a crib for two years, none of that happens. You've got to add that in. You've got to put it in consciously, all these things that you would routinely and ordinarily do. So this is what motivated me to write Love and Economics, was to try to explain to the economists 
uh, why it was so important that we attend to the policies around the family. Because if you've got kids who are never attached to anybody, they end up having trouble developing a conscience. If you've got too many people without a conscience, you can't have a free society. You can't have a free market. If everybody's stealing everything they can get away with, it's crazy. It's not going to work. So I was trying to convince the economists that this was, that this was important. Um, and, uh, and, and in the process of doing that, that's when I came into contact with a lot of social conservatives, religious people, and so on, because the economists didn't want to hear it. I mean, it was complete failure from that perspective of wanting to, you know, wanting to uh, convince the economists of something. Do we owe the children more than mere survival? See, and a lot of my libertarian friends wanted to say, uh, you know, uh, they're free agents. Uh, you, know, you don't have any obligations, really. Well, you voluntarily. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't have a clue how to even conceptualize it, right? So my concerns uh, with love and economics, when I wrote it in 2008, I had a very important social concern, which was to convince young women that their lives as mothers were extremely important. More important, it's more important what you're doing at home rocking the baby than anything you're gonna do in the office. Okay, that was my chief social concern in writing that. And my policy concerns, I was worried about uh, unmarried parenthood, because if there's separation between the mom and the dad, the mom doesn't have the support she needs to be there doing everything that needs to happen. So I was concerned about um, independent, single parenthood, unmarried parenthood. I'm obviously concerned about divorce, as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, I was worried about inappropriate welfare state rules that were incentivizing separation. And finally, it sounds almost charming, naive, to say this, but in 2001, I was worried about too much daycare. I'm actually still worried about too much daycare, but that ship has sailed, you know what I mean? I mean it's like nobody wants to think about whether we have obligations uh, and authentic constraints, you know, on, on how much time we should be putting our kids in daycare. So anyway, um, all of this is to say that the idea that kids need their parents is, I, I would say, central to the Ruth Institute of this mission. And we have a 15-minute video on that if you want to you know, go into a little bit more detail about it. So our vision of childhood, and I suspect everybody here shares the same vision of childhood with the Ruth Institute, is that uh, it, it's completely different from what Shulamith Firestone and Wilhelm Reich and Alfred Kinsey have in mind. If, if adults have sex without any taboos, children will not have permanent access to both of their parents. That's what we, that's what we are concerned about. They're not necessarily even going to know the identity of their parents. And as I think, we as a society can't allow ourselves to know, psychologically, we can't let ourselves know how serious this problem really is. Like, it would upset us too much. We'd be too ashamed, right? So, the number one lie of the sexual revolution, in my opinion, is kids are resilient. They're not that resilient. So the way parenthood has been redefined, this is what I want to put in your mind here, the parents are not really the protectors of their children. Actually, parents are potential abusers, and this is the main thing we should see in parents. They are a problem. They are not there to protect the children. This is the revolutionary view. The experts know the child better than the parents do. This is another part, aspect of it. Some of you have lived this, right? <coughs> Confronted experts who are telling you what to do. The parents don't really have the best interests of the child at heart. The state and the experts have the best interests of the child at heart. And children need to have sex without shame, apology, or hindrance. Wilhelm Reich even went so far as to say that the state should subsidize housing for children so that they could have their own place to live, so they could have sex without the parents interfering with it. And if you think about what the welfare state has done in the United States, we're pretty much there. We're pretty much there. That a 16-year-old can end up getting her own money uh, and, be, and live in an unsupervised manner and, and be able to do what she wants, with or without a father that's permanent, and so on and so forth. So we're pretty much there. So the problems with this, of course, is that this system that they're creating in their minds sets the child up to be a victim of authentic pedophiles. So even if Kinsey wasn't a pedophile himself, he's attracting pedophiles. 
right? Who's going to be drawn to this philosophy that he's cooked up here, right? People who actually do want to have sex with children. They're going to be drawn to them. The parents actually do know their child better than anybody else. You, you, you take a kid for a 45 minute interview and they know better than you? It's crazy, right? But so, so that's also uh, false. And it, it sets up socially what I would call a race to the bottom, where we say, we're going to provide food for the child because we can't be sure that you're going to actually provide them with school breakfast. And so the parents do less. And then you provide them with school lunch, and they do even less. And then you provide them with this, and they do even less and less and less. It's kind of a race to the bottom to see who's going to surrender the most rights and, and privileges to the child or to the state. I already mentioned uh, that uh, my friend Moira, Gray, Moira Graylin uh, gave her testimony about what it was like to be sexually abused by both of her parents. And what I want to say about this is that I the, the fantasy that people like Kinsey have is that if, if the adults would just relax about this stuff, the kids wouldn't really be upset. You know, it's just because it's all the taboos that are causing people to be upset. Well, I can tell you from Moira's testimony and the testimony of many other people, I have never talked to anyone who said that, who said, yeah, all the adults around me said it was fine, so therefore I didn't care. No, they all knew somewhere in their minds and bodies that it wasn't okay. No matter what was going on around them, they knew it wasn't going on. All right? So this is part of the fantasy of the sexual revolution, and it's really a form of gaslighting, you could say, to tell them, oh, it doesn't bother you. It doesn't really bother you. It doesn't really matter. So let's go back to this point that I raised earlier on, that as Catholics, we actually are part of something big and beautiful and significant. The movement to reclaim society, to defend the family. This is important, it is good, and the Catholic Church is right at the center of it. It broke my heart yesterday to hear what John Smeaton had to say about the missteps in the UK, where they said, we're not gonna include the Catholics uh, in, their, in their campaigning. In the US, I can tell you for a fact, the heart of the pro-life movement are the Catholics, and everybody knows it, and the Protestants are grateful to us, actually. They're, they're, they're willing to be grateful. So let me go back to this point of why did I bring up all of these other groups that are involved, deeply involved in sexual abuse of children systematically and systematically covering it up. Like I said, I'm not making excuses for the things that have happened in our church. Not at all. My point is, will any of these other organizations do anything about it? And I think the answer is quite clearly, we cannot count on the United Nations to do anything about it. They will throw a couple guys under the bus and business as usual, okay? And across the board, I think that's the most reasonable thing to expect of most of the institutions that are out there. And so I want to put, I want to give you one last, one last story here um, to, to illustrate where I'm going with this. In, uh, our experience as foster parents, it was mentioned in our bio, we were foster parents to eight foster children at different times. One of our kids that we got was 12 years old when we got him, and he was completely illiterate. Okay? He was in the fifth grade, he had been passed on from one grade to the next, fifth grade, could not spell his own last name. Okay? He was illiterate. And when we figured out that this is what was going on, we're like, hmm, oh, yo, yo. you know, it, was, it became pretty clear pretty quickly, you know, uh, that, that he couldn't read. So I said, you are so lucky. You are so lucky to be in this family because in this family, you are going to learn to read. Right, everybody? And the whole family was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to learn to read. <laughs> you know, the other kids got involved in it and everything. Um, and my husband's on board. And now, the point is, when I said that to him, I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no idea how I was going to get that done. But I knew two things. I, I knew two things. One, I knew that he had the chops. I knew he was smart enough that he would be able to do it. You know, there's nothing wrong with this kid. Right? And sometimes when people have learning disabilities, you can kind of tell, you can kind of intuit that there's something going on, you know? But I could tell that there wasn't anything like that. So I knew he could do it. I wasn't just blowing smoke. But the second thing I also knew is that I knew our family would not 
quit until it was done. And literally every member of the family got involved, thought it was fun, and, and was committed to helping this kid read, learn how to read. My daughter actually wrote little stories for him. My daughter, was, um, she would have been right around his age, a couple years older than him. She wrote little stories for him because of the books that are out there for kids to learn to read, they're for six-year-olds. Right, with a six-year-old vocabulary, six-year-old story. Not very interesting to a 12-year-old. So Ann wrote up little stories that would be more interesting to him. You know, everybody got involved. I knew we wouldn't give up until this was accomplished. So, the reason I'm putting this challenge to us as fellow Catholics, dealing with childhood sexual abuse in the Catholic Church is our problem. It is our church, it is our problem. That's number one. Number two, no other organization on earth will do it. And we have the ability to do it. We, none of these other groups have this. Okay, number one, we actually have a coherent theory that counters the sexual revolutionary ideology. Nobody else has got that. They don't even want it, right? They, they're not even trying to counter that thing. We have the potential to have an alternative that will put a stop to this stuff. Secondly, we have a history of practices and insights into the human condition that could actually be helpful. We know something about teaching people self-control. We know something about the aesthetic life, right? We know something about self-command. We have all this stuff in our history, in our background. We can rip, we can dig it up, put it to your use, and, uh, and, and try to make some progress in some of these areas. And very importantly, there is a body of people who love the church enough to want to reform it. Nobody loves the United Nations the way we love our church. <laughs> Am I right? Right? And I suppose that's a good thing to think of. <laughs> but if the scourge of sexual abuse is going to end, it's up to us to do something about it. So what I would say to you is that we have our choice. You can take the Catechism of the Catholic Church, or you can take the United Nations Declarations on the Right of the Child. Okay, and I know which one my money's on. The Catechism of the Catholic Church has the answers we need to deal with these problems, if we will use it, if we will not give up, if we will persevere in this matter. The sexual revolutionaries have created a system that is designed to protect adult predation and designed to disarm victims. They have created that system. They may not have meant to, maybe they didn't think this was really gonna happen. I don't know what they really thought. But the fact is, this is what they did. And this is what they're committed to. So it's up to us to present that larger, beautiful vision of marriage, family, human sexuality, children as vulnerable persons who need the protection and love of their parents. That no one else can really take the place of the parents if the parents aren't there. And I say this as an adoptive mom, as a foster mom, it would have been better for these kids if none of this had ever happened to them. If they could have been with their own mom and dad, that would have been the best thing for them, obviously, right? So this is the point. We have something to offer. We have, in my opinion, sometimes people ask me this, how can you stay in the church? The church is so messed up. Let me tell you something. We have no right to leave the church. That's my opinion. I have no right to leave the church. When I was a little girl, the deposit of faith was handed to me. It's my obligation to hand on that deposit of faith to the next generation in as good a condition as I got it. That's my obligation. And we are standing on the shoulders of saintly people who gave their lives for us. We have no right to leave the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, in the hands of men who would deface her. We have no right to leave the church. That is why I am a lifelong committed Catholic, and we are going to do something about this. Thank you very much, people of Israel.